Inside of her bedchamber in Osborne House, on the 22nd of January 1901, Queen Victoria died. There was a huge amount of chaos and panic, as Victoria had ruled since June 1837, and many had never envisioned a world without her. She was at the time the longest reigning monarch in British history, ruling for 63 years and 216 days, but at half past six in the evening, with her family including her son and heir to the throne by her side, Victoria died and slipped away. She had been ill for some time, and when she died her favourite dog was placed on her deathbed. But Victoria had made specific plans for her funeral. There was a huge amount of stress as a state funeral had not been planned for some time, and Victoria's would be a grand event. The Queen following her death was then dressed in a white dress, and the doctor placed her wedding veil over her head, but then a number of family members helped in lifting her body into the coffin. But the funeral procession would be calamitous, and things were going very wrong before her body was then taken back to the British mainland. Join us as we look at the terrible funeral of Queen Victoria, and to support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. One of the first problems with Queen Victoria's funeral occurred immediately after her death. The royal undertakers were called to come to the Isle of Wight from London, and in the panic and madness they forgot a very important object, the coffin. They arrived and had left the coffin back in London, the very wooden box that she would be buried in, and a local carpenter was then found on the island who designed and created the Queen's coffin. This was solved, but when this arrived at Osborne House, along with the royal undertakers and her family, Victoria's body was then prepared and placed in the coffin. Along with her, there were many items of importance to the Queen placed inside, including one of Prince Albert, her husband's dressing gowns, and a plaster cast off his hand, along with a lock of John Brown's hair, the Scottish servant whom she was very fond of. But interestingly, John Brown's mother's wedding ring was also placed on her finger, alluding to the fact she may have felt married to him. But the funeral was then planned to go ahead on Saturday the 2nd of February, and this would occur inside of St George's Chapel in Windsor Castle, but things continued to go wrong. No one at the time knew the procedure or the etiquette for a royal burial and a state funeral, and the planners and historians were busy researching what had happened before. There were no images to compare to, and it was said by someone inside of Osborne that the ignorance of historical precedents in men, whose business it is to know, is wonderful, alluding to the fact that planners were inept. But panic came straight after her death, but Victoria would not want to be embalmed, and she did not want her heart and entrails removing, as had been done for royal burials in the past. The hearts of kings and queens often were removed and then buried in a place separate from the rest of their body, but she also did not want a death mask cast off her face. But Kaiser Wilhelm II, her grandson, ignored this request, and had one taken, which showed the queen looking incredibly unflattering in her death. But when the royal undertaker arrived, he came asking questions about the queen's measurements, which shocked the royal family, and Kaiser Wilhelm commented on the chaos and he said, It is always like this. When an ordinary humble person dies, everything is arranged quite easily, and with reverence and care. When a personage dies, you fellows all lose your heads and make stupid mistakes, which you ought to be ashamed of. The same happens in Germany as in England. You are all alike. However, the Kaiser then decided to do his own thing, and he banned the undertakers from touching Victoria's body, and said the royal family and courtiers should deal with this. One witness said of the problems that, if the occasion had been a less grave and solemn one, there would have been much but that was humorous in the Emperor's harangue to the rather dull undertaker's assistant. The Emperor frightened the poor fellow into helpless obedience. The man was simply terrified. He was so unsuitable a person, as it appeared to me, that we declined to leave him, as he wished, in the room to take the necessary measurements. And as a matter of fact, the measurements were taken by the Emperor. Sir James Reed and myself, under the direction of the man, who stood by and told us exactly what he wanted. It was altogether a curious scene. Victoria was then placed inside of an oak shell coffin. This would be placed inside a mahogany outer coffin, but this did not get to the Isle of Wight on time. The Queen's private doctor then placed charcoal on the floor of the coffin to prevent smell, and the Kaiser, King Edward, Mrs Took, Victoria's hairdresser, and the doctor lifted Victoria's body into the coffin. The doctor added, I helped Mrs Tuck put a satin dressing gown on the Queen, and she arranged her hair and veil, then I packed the sides with bags of charcoal and muslin. 
but further arrangements for the funeral were left to other nobles and the Lord Chamberlain, whose job it was to make the funeral plans. However, these were rushed through very quickly, and were made with such haste that problems would arise further down the line. Victoria wanted a simple funeral, and to be buried with respect, but she was a woman who would spend a lot of her time wearing black following her husband's death. But for her funeral, she wanted everything to be white. She wanted the coffin draped in white, and for her country to mourn her. But there was confusion as to what the royals should wear, as her granddaughter wrote, There was great consternation and bewilderment in the Lord Chamberlain's office, as well as in the royal family, as to what was the correct mourning for the sovereign. It was 64 years since such a tragic event had taken place. No one knew what should be worn. Old prints and pictures of long ago were studied to see how to bring up to date and modernise the cumbersome trappings of mourning. But there were further problems in London, as the funeral was on the horizon, and on the 1st of February Victoria's coffin was brought onto the royal yacht, the Alberta, It was then taken across the Solent. Mourners gathered, and the ship set sail and 40 warships escorted Victoria on her final journey and fired salutes. It was a huge spectacle and one witness said, hardly less solemn and striking than yesterday's great historic naval pageant, was the night vigil on board the funeral barge, where the late Queen may almost be said to have lain in state upon the bosom of the waters, over which till a few hours ago she held at such regal sway. The coffin was guarded all night by trusty marines. Outside the basin lay the Victoria and Albert, with the King and other royal mourners on board. Beyond them, the long array of warships forming a glittering lane, scintillating with myriads of light and extending as far as the eye could reach across the still dark waters of the Solent. On the next day the weather was terrible, and it was raining heavily across the country, but despite this thousands still turned out onto the streets to pay their respects to Queen Victoria. There were thousands, and there was even a crush when people rushed to see the coffin. But following a short train journey to Windsor, a procession from the station to St George's Chapel began. But there was a terrible mistake coming, That morning the horses were freezing cold, and when they pulled the gun carriage, of which Victoria's coffin had been placed on top of, this broke free, and it ran off in the distance. This was a big problem, and because of this the royal tradition of the gun carriage being pulled by 138 naval guards was created, rather than using the horses. Those who had been in charge of the horses were said to have been furious and humiliated. It was said, you could hear a band in the distance, but nothing was happening. Then Queen Alexandra came tearing out, before Clarendon persuaded her to go back into the chapel. The funeral party then arrived at the church and the service did go well. It was said that glorious music beloved by the Queen rose from the organ and choristers. The white coffin with its gleaming crown and orbs was lifted onto the bier, above the throng standing around it. The words of hope and peace and faith of the burial service were said. The herald proclaimed the departure of the one mighty sovereign the accession of King Edward the Seventh, and then gradually the mourners left, and the banners in the gorgeous array above the dark carved pinnacles of the chancel walls drooped alone over the guardsmen, who in their bearskins and with their arms reversed remained to watch over the dead. The burial was then to take place along with the committal, but there had been a rehearsal of this, which had gone ahead the day before. But then on the third of February, Victoria was finally interred beside her husband, Prince Albert, but in one final mishap, a mentally ill man had snuck into the service and he was then led away. But Victoria got her white funeral, as during this part of the funeral proceedings, there was snow falling from the clouds. Queen Victoria's funeral problems were caused by the fact she had reigned for so long that no one understood the precedence for the monarch's funeral. Throughout the centuries, things have changed, and different kings and queens have had different elements to their funeral. But Victoria was at the time the longest reigning monarch in British history, but her funeral and death brought a huge amount of stress and upset to the royal family. Thanks for watching. To support our channel, please make sure to subscribe, and once again, thank you so much for watching.